Hello and welcome to the Study Legal English podcast. I'm your host Louise and today I'm very pleased to have on the show Eloisius Chang, ladies and gentlemen. Eloisius is an associate in the Singapore office at the international law firm King and Spalding. He is a Singaporean disputes lawyer specialising in international arbitration. He has published many articles and was the winner of the prestigious prize called the Christopher Bathurst Prize for Best Legal Advice. Now, what makes Eloisius interesting, well, apart from many of these things, is that not only is he an advocate and solicitor in Singapore, but he's also a solicitor in England and Wales. Yes, he is qualified in two jurisdictions. Many of you may be wondering, well, how did he do that? How can I do that? Well, you're in the right place to find out because this is exactly what we will be talking about in today's interview. The way that you, as a foreign lawyer, become qualified in England and Wales is by currently taking the QLTS, the Qualified Lawyers Transfer Scheme. But pay attention because in autumn 2020, yes, that's this year, ladies and gentlemen, the Solicitors Qualifying Exam, SQE, will replace the Qualifying Lawyers Transfer Scheme, QLTS. But don't worry, we're pretty sure that it will be very, very similar. So what we discuss today will still be relevant for you, even if you take the SQE at a later date. Now, I came across Eloisius on LinkedIn. He'd written an excellent article called The QLTS Examinations, A Plan for Those with Not Quite Enough Time. I'm sure we can all relate to this, not having enough time and having a million and one things that we need to do. So in this particular article, Eloisius talks about his experience of preparing and studying and actually taking and passing the QLTS in just two weeks. Wow. He explains how he studied, he gives tips for resources, and he gives readers the opportunity to download some very helpful documents which he wrote as well. And I'm going to leave a link to that particular article in the show notes. Now, before we hear the interview, I've got a quick question for you listeners. Are you a qualified lawyer in England and Wales, or would you like to be? Why? Do you think this could be helpful for you in your career? Let me know. Send me an email to louise at studylegalenglish.com. So now, let's sit back and relax. Let's listen to that interview. Hi, Eloisius. Thanks for coming on the show. Hi, hi. Happy to be here. Before we kind of go into the questions, I obviously did my homework. I've read up about you and I saw on LinkedIn someone, one of your recommendations or something, mentioned that you'd worked in Oman. You'd uh, worked as a tribunal secretary in an arbitration in Oman. I gather we can't go into any confidential details, but how was Oman? What did you think of Muscat? Well, the arbitration was seated in Oman and it was governed by their rules, but I, I never actually went to Oman. It was all done uh, online because there were facilities for people to participate in the arbitration, whether by email or by video conferencing. So I, I never actually stepped one foot into Oman, but I was involved in this arbitration from the beginning to this end. Gosh, that's the, the wonderful thing about technology nowadays. And such a great thing about arbitration is that you can choose to, well, conduct it all online. So that's brilliant. So good for international clients. Oh, the reason I asked was because I've recently done some work in Muscat and it's a lovely, lovely, gorgeous city. So, well, if you have the opportunity... I recommend going. <laughs> Someday, yes, perhaps. Yeah, that arbitration was an interesting one. It was essentially a telecommunications dispute. I, I can't really go into much detail beyond that. But I participated in that arbitration when I was working for an arbitrator back in 2014 to 2015, if I'm not wrong. And it was an interesting piece of work because I was I was working as the tribunal secretary for that case. So I was essentially helping my boss, the presiding arbitrator, to 
deal with some administrative aspects of, of the case and to do legal research and basically assist him with whatever he needs to adjudicate the case at hand. Nice experience. Do you prefer arbitration to litigation? Do you have a preference? Oh, well, I only do arbitration now because I'm in an international firm in Singapore that doesn't do litigation because we're in a ring-fenced jurisdiction, so we only operate in certain areas of the law, and one of them is uh, international arbitration. When it comes to litigation, I used to do it. I was trained in litigation in my first firm in Singapore. It was a local firm. And I did some litigation with the arbitrator that I worked for as well. So I did it for a total of about two years. When it comes to litigation versus arbitration, it's actually quite different, especially with the kind of cases that an international arbitration firm would do. So litigation, as you can tell, is is a very domestic, court-driven process. There's a lot of discipline. There are lots of rules that you have to follow. Uh, Rules of court can span up to 800 pages. And of course, you get to go to court a lot. It's a very fast-paced activity and a lot of face-to-face as well. But in arbitration, it's quite different. Most of the time, the cases are really big. So the kind of hearings that you go to, they only occur like once or twice a year. Most of the interim applications are done by telephone hearings or video hearings because everybody's everywhere. One party can be from the Philippines and the other party is from the U.S., So it it doesn't really make sense for people to keep flying everywhere to try and attend a particular venue just to adjudicate a certain, sometimes rather minor point. So most of it is done online or by telephone or even email if it's simple enough. And as a result, things can move quite fast. But at the same time, there are other issues about arbitration that may make it a little bit slow and expensive. But I'm not going to go into a full-blown discussion about pros and cons, Mm -hmm. but That's just how it is. And one other aspect I I would say is that arbitration is a lot more international. So you get people and lawyers from all kinds of jurisdictions everywhere. The lawyers who operate in these cases are, in most cases, qualified in multiple jurisdictions, like myself. I've seen people qualified in four jurisdictions. That's, that's That's the kind of people that we're dealing with here. So very international I like a really modern business approach, I think. We could have another interview just to talk about arbitration, but we'll proceed on to talking about the QLTS. I think you mentioned this in your article. You trained in the common law. English is your native language. You're coming from that perspective already. Those are really helpful points to have before we actually talk about the exam. How similar is the Singaporean jurisdiction, the way the system functions to the system of England and Wales? It's very similar. We used to be a British colony, so all of our legal systems were inherited from the British. Essentially, the institutions are the same. We have the same system of common law. We have judge-made decisions. There is the doctrine of stare decisis, so courts follow the decisions of senior courts. Our law is built upon the base of English law. So while there are some aspects that have changed, that have moved on from what English law was back then, the whole basis of how legislation and and case law is built up in Singapore is fundamentally the same. Yeah, I guess if a lawyer is coming from a civil law jurisdiction or Islamic law, then maybe the first step is to really get your head around the way precedent and the common law system functions. Well, yes. One of the subjects that you have to study in a QLTS is the English legal system. You're expected to know the hierarchy of the courts, how decisions are made, how legislation fits into the overall picture. I guess for someone who doesn't come from a common law country, it's not so hard to pick it up on what the English legal system is. But the bigger difficulty is probably the fact that he or she may not be comfortable with the English language itself, mm. which is probably where you come in, right? If you're listening to the podcast, you're, you're in the right place. <laughs> so uh, tell us, what is the QLTS? Well, the QLTS is, is basically a set of examinations to allow qualified lawyers to qualify as solicitors in England and Wales. So it's, it's what a lawyer who's already qualified in his own jurisdiction needs to pass in order to be qualified to practice in England and Wales as a solicitor. So one prerequisite is that you must already be qualified somewhere else. 
And the QRTS accepts most jurisdictions, not all, but most. So those who hope to take the QRTS should check whether their pre-existing qualification actually is accepted by the exam itself. So most jurisdictions, if you're a qualified lawyer already, you're likely to be eligible, but there are a few jurisdictions that maybe are excluded. And just to be clear, the QLTS is for people who could potentially practice as a solicitor in England. Is that correct? Not about Yes. Solicitor only. The barrister qualification has a different set of um, procedures and exams to follow. Mm. It's generally much harder. So just to be clear, remember, listeners, barristers, generally, we can say the general distinction is that barristers, they do litigation, especially in the higher courts. Solicitors can do litigation. They can go to court. They also can do transactional work. So just remember that distinction if you wanted to take this exam just to do litigation in the High Courts of England, then perhaps it's, it's not the right exam for you. So just take that into account. Good. So it's this set of exams. How many exams are we talking? Well, it, it comes in two parts. The first one is the MCT, the Multiple Choice Test, which, as the name suggests, involves answering questions with multiple choice answers. This is usually taken at your home jurisdiction or a test center nearby. So in Singapore, for example, you can take it in Singapore when there was a test center. For some other jurisdictions, they may have to go to a particular country that actually has a test center, but it's usually not too far off. So that's part one of it. Then there's part two of it, which is the Organized Structure Clinical Examinations, or OSCE for short. That's a practical examination involving research, interviewing, drafting, writing, presentations, and advocacy skills. And this this has to be taken in London. You actually have to take a flight up there, get accommodations, and go to the Kaplan Test Centre to be examined practically by a set of examiners. So two parts, and those two parts span many different areas of law? Yes. So first of all, you have to pass the first part before you can take the next part. And it happens sequentially. And the MCT, the first part, examines quite a number of subjects, which include like contract law, tort law, criminal law, land law, equity and trusts, public law, business law, tax law. It's a very long list, you know, so it's a lot of subjects to wrap your head around. And so within each of those subjects... I suppose you need to know the law, you need to be up to date on the law, and as well for the practical side, you need to have practical skills like advocacy, like client interviewing and things like that. Yes, precisely. So the first part is about what you know about the law, and then the second part, the OSCE, is about how you apply your knowledge of the law in actual legal practice situations. And the first part, so it's multiple choice, Does that mean that it's easier than the second part? Well, no. Well, (laughs) yes and no. It's easier in the sense that it's probably less nerve-wracking. You have a set of maybe five choices to choose from, and the answers are usually pretty close. You know, you'll be spending some time trying to decide between one or the other, and and that can really rack up time because you only have a set amount of time to answer each question. And it can be quite tricky and and stressful to answer them. But at least it's just clicking on an answer. If you don't know the answer, you just click on a random one and move on. But when it comes to the OSCE, you're you're actually talking to someone in real life. And it can be kind of embarrassing if you actually don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, so maybe easy. Easy is not the right word for the QLTS multiple choice. But maybe, yeah, maybe slightly less nerve-wracking. So why did you decide to take this exam or this set of exams? Well, well, the simple reason is that my, my firm needed me to take it. Well, most of our work is actually governed by English law as the governing law for the simple reason that English law is the most popular form of governing law for commercial transactions, especially international transactions. You know, if, if you're not qualified in the most used governing law option in the world, then there's going to be a lot of um, disputes or transactions that you can't actually work on. 
So I would say that for any aspiring international lawyer, the very first step is getting qualified in uh, England and Wales. That's a very good point. So, you know, the governing law of a lot of international transactions is the law of England and Wales. If you're not qualified in that area, you're, well, you're going to be limiting yourself if you want to be an international lawyer. So, you know, this, this could be the first step to really broadening your opportunities. Looking for a job in the UK, I've heard of many employers who, because of the recent situation with COVID and Brexit, you know, these days they don't even have time to deal with resumes that don't list down a qualification in England and Wales. The market is in this situation right now where if you don't even have the qualification in England and Wales, then you're skipped over entirely. And you have to have that as a start, as a base. So, yeah, an essential qualification for an international lawyer. So let's talk about how you prepared for it. I mean, I can't believe the amount of stuff that you have to know. And in your article, you say you just had two weeks, (laughs) two weeks to prepare. What were you thinking? Why did you only have two weeks? Well... I, I regret everything. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, was, it, it was not by choice. I had very little time to prepare for it because I was very busy at work during both the MCT and the OSCE. So I, I didn't really have the option to study for it regularly, whether it be it after work or during the weekend. So what I did was that I negotiated with my firm for a two-week period of study leave prior to each exam. So naively I thought that oh you know it's two weeks it's okay I'm trained in the common law it's not too bad but actually it turned out to be a lot harder and a lot more content than I thought it would be so even even two weeks wasn't really enough the traditional way of studying for it is getting a bunch of textbooks called the OUP textbooks and they are not concise they have too much material going on so I had to find some other way of getting my results So I I asked a lot of friends and I did a lot of research on what worked for them, what didn't work for them, how they managed to cram in a very short amount of time, even though they had more time than me, but I had to make it work somehow. And so I was recommended a bunch of notes from a website called lawanswered.com, which sells concise, high-quality notes made by past candidates in the um, graduate diploma in law and legal practice courses in England and Wales. So these courses, they cover roughly the same topics that are covered in the QLTS examinations. And because they're very concise, they just give you exactly what you need. You don't have to waste too much time studying things that are not covered by the exam. It was a very quick and dirty way for me to try and get my English flow up to scratch. So that was what I did. And I also did uh, a couple of practice tests. Like for the MCT, I did sample questions that you can find on the Kaplan website. And for the OSCE, it was a different ball game altogether because it's all about practice, right? And when I went into it, it, it was kind of opaque. They don't really tell you what is really being examined. They don't give you any sample questions that you, that you can practice on. So what I did was that I signed up for a course provider called QLTS Advantage. Now, you don't have to sign up for a course provider if you have the time. But for me, I just had two weeks So I I had no choice. I signed up for it. And another one thing that I did was I did some past papers and model answers from the Chartered Institute of Legal Executives website, Silex, C-I-L-E-X. You can get it. It's it's free online. And those cover roughly the same topics as well. You can go search for it and they would be able to give you a rough idea of what kind of content they're looking for. So you've given a few you know, resources there of what you used. And listeners, to give you an idea, I mean, the stuff that you need to know, I mean, basically, you're taking the content of a three-year law degree. Or in England, we also have the option, if you haven't done a law degree, you can do something called the, the what is it, the, the GDL, I think? GDL. The GDL, which is a one-year course, I believe, that kind of condenses all of that material into this one-year course. Even so, it's a one-year course. So what Eloise just did was condense all of that into two weeks. 
which is uh, quite a feat. I mean, really, really impressive. And so you said time was really against you. Generally, if you're studying for this at a normal pace, you'd use the Oxford University Press some books that you mentioned in your article, but instead you used some some resources from the law answered notes, which were kind of more condensed. So you used those to study. You also did practical exam kind of sample questions to help you prepare. And then for the more practical side of stuff, what did you do? You had to get people to kind of help you with yeah. these things. So one thing that you have to do is that you have to practice like giving client interviews, writing attendance notes, advocacy before an English judge, and giving presentations to clients. You have to practice, but I didn't know at that point in time what was the format or the content of the questions that were going to be posed to me. So some of my friends recommended a course provider, a QLTS Advantage. So this course provider actually put up a lot of videos online demonstrating what the questions would look like or what kind of environment these practical questions would be set in. So I went in with a certain degree of confidence as to what to expect as opposed to just going in blind and, and trying to figure my way out. So that was very useful for me. Yeah, just having a kind of idea because if you're going in with no idea what to expect, that even from a psychological perspective could make you a bit more nervous because you're totally going into the unknown. So I think that sounds like a good thing to have done to enroll in that particular course and watch those videos. In the article that I keep referring to, you know, you actually go through specifically, quite specifically what you have to do in both of these parts. So listeners, you know, if we don't, we're not going to cover everything here, but, you know, do check out Eloisha's his article to get further information. But I wanted to ask, you know, if you were doing the MCT, this multiple choice test, and you didn't know the answer, are there any tips that you've got? Or, you know, are there any things that you didn't know before you took it that you know now that you can share with the listeners? Yeah. So when I went into the exam hall, I was trying wrongly in my view right now to get every answer right it's not possible so you only have a very limited amount of time to answer the question so you have to set aside maybe a minute and a half for each question so if you look at a question and you don't really know what the answer is you know it, it could be a tricky one it could be that certain answers are very close to one another and not really sure which one is right I spend way too much time on some of these questions. Maybe I spend two minutes, three minutes on these questions trying to figure out which one would be the best fit answer. And that was a mistake in my view because it just made the last few questions like an utter disaster. You know? So the exam is split into two halves. There's a break in between. So during the first half, I was trying to do that and I realized that it was a mistake. It was just simply not possible to try and answer every single question correctly unless you studied very thoroughly for it. I didn't. I didn't have the time. So for those questions that I really don't know the answer to, I would just randomly put down one selection and move on to, to the next. And chances are in the next few questions, there's something that you actually do know and you can answer with some confidence. And my advice would be don't spend too much time answering the questions and don't worry if you don't know all of them it's okay because all you need to do is pass there is no significance to the grading whatsoever so long as you pass and the second tip that i would say is that if you really don't have enough time and i'm saying this from my own experience like i really didn't have the time to cover all like what 10 11 subjects within two weeks so there were some subjects that i studied less there were subjects that I was already familiar with, like contract law, tort law, and these subjects, I focused on them so that you know, I would get the questions right. So for the, for the subjects that were a bit more alien to me, like English property law or EU law, I, I opted to either just skim through them or maybe even forego them all, altogether. I know I, I didn't really do much studying for tax law because there was just no time. And there was a lot of calculations involved in how much inheritance tax you would get, you know, so on and so forth. You know, 
And the questions typically are very long. So when I encountered those questions, I would just skip them all together. I just put down one random answer and move on to the next. Okay. So the first tip is you've literally got around one, two minutes per question. So if you don't know the answer, put something and continue on to the next one. Is the MCT, is it a paper exam or is it done on a computer? It's done on a computer and you have a whiteboard that you can write on and that's about it. So are you able to go back to questions or once you've done it, you can't go back? You can go back, yes, but obviously not recommended because you just don't have time. Okay, so go through the questions. If there's a question you don't know, put an answer. You're probably not going to have time at the end to go back to it anyway, but at least that frees up time for answering the questions that you do know. And then your second tip was you probably aren't going to be able to study everything. So study a few, couple of subjects so that you know them well, and then some others just kind of skim, skim through them. And you mentioned this, this idea that you don't need to be perfect. You don't need to get 100%, get that idea out of your head. And instead, just remember that you just need to pass. Is pass 50 one percent what's the pass mark it, it varies every year but it's, it's usually about somewhere in the 60 percent range mm. I, i'm not quite sure now but i would say like don't let perfect get in the way of good good mm. in this case is pass that's all you need i love that perfectionism is an enemy to progress i i think and so make sure you're good enough you sound like i don't know if you watch suits do you watch suits a little bit, yeah. A little bit. Mike Ross, when he's giving some tips to Rachel for passing the LSAT or something like that. She's trying to get every question right. And Mike's like, you know, you're not going to do that. Just stop worrying about being perfect and just exactly the questions. <laughs> so good tip. So you've got a nice quote on your article, Leonard Bernstein, to achieve great things, two things are needed, a plan and not quite enough time. Do you think that in a sense, not having much time actually helped you to just get this done? Well, there's a saying, no inspiration like desperation, right? So uh, <laughs> there was certainly, it was like a whip cracking in my back, you know, like I was working crazy hours on, on this thing. It was, I, I woke up at maybe 8 a.m., had a small breakfast, studied all the way to lunch, had a short lunch and studied all the way to dinner and studied again until I was just knackered and went to bed. So that, that, that was how two weeks was like and I do not recommend that for anyone. So it also helps to have a supportive partner. Yes, <laughs> she's yes. waving to me now. No, but it's, <laughs> it's really important to have someone <laughs> who has your back. Okay, yeah. and is able to withstand the fact that you disappear for a grand total of two weeks. And while I say that, in retrospect, yes, the lack of time did help put some seriousness and, and some thought into how I was going to accomplish this. But again, I strongly do not recommend doing it in two weeks' time. Start early, have a consistent study plan, do it on your downtime, do it after work, do it during your weekends, put in a solid two months of consistent studying. And I'm not even sure how much of my lifespan I shaved off trying to pull this off, you know. So don't go there. Just try and do it at your own pace. My note is really for people who were in similar situations as I did. So it's really for people who are working full time in a firm that is very demanding on your time. And if you don't have the luxury of having two months to study on your downtime, then my note is perfect for you. It gives you a plan to get somewhere in two weeks. It's possible, but don't do it if you can avoid it. <laughs> yeah, it's possible. You can see that Eloisius has done it. This reminds me of a film I watched on the weekend, which was about, I watched two films about two rock climbers. The first one was about Tommy Caldwell. I think it's called the Dawn Wall or something like that. He basically opened up a climbing route on uh, El Capitan in Yosemite National Park. And, you know, he did this incredible thing that nobody thought was possible. Then I watched another film that was about someone who climbed another route on El Capitan, the same kind of cliff mountain, 
without any ropes, with no oh, safety. I mean, honestly, it was like if he'd have fallen, he would have died. And I kind of see see what you're doing. You know, the two months QLTS plan is kind of like that second film. If you want to do something challenging, listeners, do the two months studying and you're still doing something incredible. If you want to take it to the next danger level, do what Eloisa did. I'm glad that I did it, but I wasn't glad while doing it. So, <laughs> yeah. So in the practical side of things, Presumably, you're getting marked on your legal knowledge, but are you also getting marked on, I don't know, your ability to, for example, in the client interview, you wrote about the need to express things in, in a clear way for the clients. Is that something that's quite important? Yes, because no, no client is going to walk into the office and understand legalese. So you have to basically speak in plain English that any ordinary person would understand. If you go in spouting legal terms, Latin and all that, you're just going to be viewed as some strange creature speaking a foreign language and you're of no help. You'll be wasting time at the exam as well. That's one thing. And the second thing is these clients are human beings. So they'll probably have certain emotional states when they come into the office. You know, they'll be sad, they'll be angry, they'll be upset. And it's your job, at least in the first interview, you know, to try and empathize and try and find out what is upsetting them so much and how you can help. You can't go in there like a robot and say, okay, you need to do A, B, C, D, E. You, you have to understand what are the effects of the story that are driving their current emotional state and try and empathize, sympathize and lead them to the right answer. How do you do that? Like what kind of questions do you ask or how do you show that in the client interview? Well, for example, if there is a interview for a potential criminal law client, he or she may come in and be very upset about what just happened to him or her. So let's say the client was caught apparently stealing a scarf or something from a department store, but actually she was just trying it on and then the scarf went into her bag, she forgot about it, and then she got arrested because she was caught on the security cameras that she was stealing an item, but actually she had no intent to steal the item. Obviously, she's upset. You would probably have to console her and tell her, like, it's not your fault. You know, maybe you didn't take your medication on time. It just made you a little groggy and you forgot about it. You know, we'll, we'll take care of this. We'll, we'll help you out. This is your defense. But at the same time, don't go overboard because sometimes these clients, they lie about things. You have to be careful about what you say as well. More often than not, a lot of the times what the client tells you, in real life, I mean, what the client tells you is not exactly the real picture of what's going on. Mm -mm. So kind of asking questions, trying to get the, the real picture. You might not guess it straight away. Be careful with yes. what, what you say. You were saying, you know, don't worry, you haven't taken your medication, presumably in the facts of that case, there's something to do with the, the client having yeah. some kind of mental health problems. Yeah, that you kind of have to, to tease out from the interview itself. Like mm. you may not know it from the start, but as you ask questions along, like what happened during the day? What were you doing before you went to the department store? Did you drink any alcohol? Do you, do you take any medication? Does it doesn't affect your state of mind? Criminal law stuff, like, you know, trying to suss out what exactly was the state of mind at the relevant point in time. Because mm -hmm. the act has, has already been committed, so you have actus reus, but then the question now is your mens rea, your state of mind. So you're just trying to get as much information as you can. Mm, 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 mm. That's very helpful to know about how you actually go through the client interview and these practical activities. And I love that you, you know, you said, well, look, you know, you kind of have to speak the client's own language. You can't go in there speaking legalese. And this is something that the, the regular listeners to the show will know that I always bang on about using plain English in either writing clear contracts, but also, you know, we're hearing from Eloise that as well, it's very important when you're speaking to clients, you know, they don't want you to be spouting legalese at them that they don't understand. It's, of course, great to understand your legalese, but also to know when it's appropriate and not. 
So final question, I think. What advice do you have for someone who is considering taking this qualification? Well, prepare and practice like again and again and again before the exam date. You may think that you have time, but life will have other plans for you. Work will always get in the way. So don't anticipate that, oh, you know, there'll be time. No, there won't be time. So whenever you have any time at all, just use it to study and or to prepare. And the extent of preparation that you need, of course, will depend on your background as a lawyer. So if you're already qualified in a common law jurisdiction, you're going to have an easier time. If you're from Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, any one of the former British colonies, it's okay. It's, it's manageable, even if you don't have time, because the concepts are things that you've already encountered before. But if you come from a civil law background, if, if you're from mainland China, if you're from Russia, or, or if you're from some African uh, states, it's going to be harder for you. So if you find that you need more help because the common law is just so alien to you, then maybe spend some time familiarizing yourself with the, what the common law is first before attempting the exam. Yeah, just try not to do it like how I did it. Have a consistent study plan. You can use my plan, but spread it out over like two months. You know, the article that you wrote, it's very, very helpful. And you give readers the opportunity to get in touch with you for some documents that you very generously offer to send them, which are example documents of your attendance note, notes from the client interview. There's a shareholder meeting, I think. And these are really helpful examples. So listeners, if you're considering taking this exam, get in touch with Eloisius. You can contact him on LinkedIn. I'll leave a link to his uh, article and his LinkedIn profile in the show notes. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. It's been so interesting and very helpful, very practical advice. Thank you, Eloisius. Not at all. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Great. So that's the end of the interview. And listeners, I hope that this has been helpful for you. Do check out Eloisius on LinkedIn. Connect with him. Ask him questions if you've got specific questions about the QLTS. And make sure you check out his article. I'm leaving a link to it in the show notes. Also, finally, remember my question. Are you a qualified solicitor in England and Wales or would you like to be? Why? Why could this be helpful for you? Let me know. Send me an email to louise at studylegalenglish.com or do connect with me on social media. So thanks for listening and see you next time.